In late July of 1999, a 35-year-old woman stepped out of her apartment building in Manhattan, New York, just as the sun was coming up. It had been an especially hot summer, so she'd been going for runs as early as possible to try to beat the heat. She strapped her Walkman to her waistband and settled headphones over her ears as she jogged down the sidewalk toward the park. But when she turned the corner, she came to a sudden stop. Just in front of her, in the middle of the sidewalk, lay something big and black. The woman peered at the motionless object and saw that it was covered with these blue and black feathers. She inched closer and realized it was a huge dead crow. Then she glanced at the sidewalk ahead of her and she gasped. Dead crows were all over the sidewalk. She counted six or seven scattered all down the street. The woman looked around her, trying to find some kind of explanation for what she was seeing, but as she did, another crow right above her suddenly stopped flying and fell to the ground with a thud. 60-year-old Douglas Wise knelt down inside of his garden, pulling weeds out of the small vegetable patch behind his townhouse in Queens, New York. It was August 1999, and just like every other day that summer, it was hot and muggy. Doug's shirt stuck to his back as he worked. After he finished pulling up all the weeds, he sprayed the soil with some weed killer. He paused for a moment to admire the fat tomatoes ripening on the vines he'd planted that spring. He intended to use every one of them in homemade marinara sauce. When his garden was looking neat and trim, Doug gathered the weeds into a garbage bag and then took them to the compost bin inside of his garage. Doug tried not to gag as he opened the lid. On hot days like this, the bin could smell absolutely disgusting. He dumped the weeds onto the decaying pile of eggshells and table scraps. Then, to help the composting process along, he took a bucket of rainwater he'd collected the week before and poured a little into the bin. He smiled to himself, knowing how his wife Carmen quietly hated that he collected rainwater in large buckets, but it had actually come in handy earlier in the summer when they'd gone more than a month without rain. Doug had enough water for composting and a little extra for his garden, all while being able to conserve tap water. Doug closed the bin and then grabbed a beer from the garage refrigerator and sat in a folding chair on the porch near the sidewalk. After a few hours in his garden, Doug liked to have a drink and people watch. It was his idea of a perfect Sunday afternoon. When Doug finished the last of his beer, he tossed the can into a recycling bin and headed inside for a shower. He was careful not to touch anything on his way to the bathroom. Carmen had just cleaned the house from top to bottom, and she'd kill him if she saw dirt smudges on anything. After Doug rinsed off and had some dinner, he joined his wife in the living room to watch some TV. But as he sat there, he started to feel a headache come on, and so he began rubbing his temples, and he wondered if maybe staring at the screen and straining his eyes was causing this headache. So he asked his wife to turn off the TV. But even after she did, over the next few minutes, his headache only got worse. Doug finally went to the kitchen and took some aspirin. And while that did help his head feel a bit better, his stomach now started to feel queasy. And so Doug told his wife that he just didn't feel right, and so he was going to go to bed early. He wasn't sure if maybe he ate something bad, or if he was actually getting sick, like with the flu. Carmen agreed that he should just go to bed, because after all, he'd spent the whole day in the yard under the beating sun. Doug kissed his wife goodnight and headed upstairs, hoping to feel better in the morning. But the next morning, when his alarm went off at 7 a.m., he was groggy and still had a headache, and his stomach still churned. Next to him, his wife had sat up, and she turned to him and said, you know, you better get up if you don't want to be late for work. But Doug asked her to grab the phone for him because he felt absolutely terrible and he needed to call in sick. Three days later, Carmen ladled some chicken noodle soup into a bowl, then placed it on a tray alongside a glass of ginger ale and some saltine crackers. Carefully, she carried it all up the stairs to the bedroom. Doug was in the bedroom, in bed, propped up on pillows. After three days of feeling totally sick, he'd lost a lot of fluids and looked very pale. As she set the tray onto the bedside table, she told her husband that she'd also bring him up a Gatorade. Carmen frowned as Doug nodded feebly. Her husband had been sick only a handful of times over the years, and when he was, it was rarely for more than 24 hours, and he had never been this weak and pale. Whatever bug her husband had caught, it had knocked him flat out. Carmen left the bedroom and headed downstairs to get the Gatorade from the fridge, and then when she had it, she went back up the stairs, and when she went back into the bedroom, she was surprised to see that Doug was not eating his soup. She asked if he was hungry, and Doug said that he was, but he said his hands were not steady enough to hold the bowl. 
Then he asked for Carmen's help walking to the bathroom. He said he was just too weak to get up on his own. Now Carmen was truly concerned. As she helped her husband to his feet and led him to the bathroom, she did her best to conceal her worry. Once Doug came out of the bathroom and was tucked back into his bed, Carmen asked him if he'd like her to feed him some soup. But Doug didn't respond. Instead, he just kind of stared out the window like he didn't even hear her. For several moments, Carmen spoke Doug's name with increasing urgency, but he just continued his glassy stare, saying nothing. Carmen was now terrified. She thought maybe Doug was having a stroke. So she grabbed the phone and called 911. It took a few minutes for an ambulance to arrive. While they waited, Carmen sat on the edge of the bed as Doug seemed to slip in and out of a trance, at times barely registering what was happening around him. By the time the paramedics arrived and moved Doug onto a stretcher, he was barely conscious. Carmen followed the paramedics downstairs and then out to the ambulance waiting in the driveway. She prayed silently as two EMTs hoisted up Doug's stretcher and secured it in the back of the ambulance. Then one of the men turned around and offered Carmen a hand, helping her into the back of the ambulance as well. Carmen took a seat on the bench, keeping one hand on her husband. As they sped towards the hospital, for the first time in her life, Carmen worried about losing her husband. Once the ambulance arrived at Flushing Hospital, Doug was rushed into the emergency room while a nurse brought Carmen to the waiting area. After about a half hour, a doctor wearing scrubs and a lab coat approached Carmen and brought her to Doug's room. Doug was lying in bed, still looking a bit out of it, with an IV hooked up to his arm. Carmen rushed over to him and kissed his forehead. The doctor told Carmen that he was fairly positive Doug had pneumonia, and if everything went well, he'd be back to normal in just a few days. Carmen squeezed Doug's shoulder, relieved to hear that he'd be okay. Later that same afternoon, the infectious disease specialist at Flushing Hospital, Dr. Debbie Asnes, was pouring herself a cup of coffee in the staff break room when her pager beeped. She checked the message and saw there was an emergency downstairs and she was needed right away. Dr. Asnes raised her eyebrows. It was unusual for the infectious disease specialist to be paged to the emergency room. If she was being called, it had to be a very unusual case that required outside of the box thinking. And Dr. Asnes loved a challenge. Throughout her nearly 20 years as a doctor, she'd always been drawn to puzzling cases. She'd spent a lot of her career researching HIV, and she'd witnessed firsthand how bad things could get when doctors did not understand how a disease worked. So without a second thought, she set her coffee down, headed out of the break room, and ran to the elevator. The moment the elevator doors opened back up on the ER floor, she could hear a man's voice carrying down the hallway. He was yelling about some strange woman standing near his bed. As Dr. Asnes approached, the ER doctor who had paged her popped his head out of the man's room and waved her in. The patient who was yelling was Doug. For the first few hours he'd spent in the ER, he'd mostly just slept, but he'd woken up in a sudden panic and now he was yelling incoherently at the people all around him. At the same time, Carmen, his wife, was standing by his side, trying to remind him who she was. As Dr. Asnes watched this, she immediately noticed something strange. Despite being agitated, Doug's arms and legs remained still and limp on the hospital bed. The ER doctor explained to Dr. Asnes that Doug was being treated for pneumonia, but the medical team was starting to think that that was not the right diagnosis. Ten minutes ago, Doug woke up confused and agitated and didn't recognize his wife. He started flailing his arms and the nurse ran in to restrain him, but then his arms and legs just went limp, and he'd not been able to move them since. Now Dr. Asnes understood why she had been called. Pneumonia does not make people paralyzed. Doug's symptoms were far more likely to have been caused by an infectious disease, and that was Dr. Asnes's area of expertise. And Dr. Asnes was very thankful the ER staff paged her so quickly because she now suspected that Doug's confusion was likely being caused by swelling in his brain, which is very, very dangerous. Just then, Doug suddenly went silent. Dr. Asnes bent over the bed and realized he was gasping for air. Dr. Asnes said that Doug needed to be moved to the intensive care unit in case his breathing got even worse. The ER doctor agreed and told the nurse to get Doug ready to move. Within minutes, the nurse and the ER doctor each grabbed a side of Doug's hospital bed and wheeled it out of the room. As she followed Doug, Dr. Asnes turned to Carmen and asked her to stay behind until they stabilized her husband. 
Then, as Doug was wheeled down the hallway, Dr. Asnes grabbed onto his bed to help steer him to the elevator. She was already thinking about which tests Doug would need. A few hours later, Dr. Asnes stood in her office reviewing Doug's charts. She had ordered a test of Doug's spinal fluid because to her, something was clearly wrong with his nervous system. But she was puzzled by the results she was looking at. The test found clear evidence of a brain infection called viral encephalitis, but Dr. Asnes was not sure that was correct. Although many of Doug's symptoms were consistent with viral encephalitis, it wouldn't explain his sudden muscle weakness. And Doug's breathing problems were more severe than the doctor normally saw in a case of viral encephalitis. Before Dr. Asnes could think any further, her pager sounded, and when she looked at it, she saw she was needed again in the emergency room. So Dr. Asnes ran back to the elevator, she took it down to the main floor of the hospital, and then she began running down the hallway towards the ER. But when she was only about halfway down the hallway, a colleague came out of the ER and ran right up to her and began telling her about the emergency that she was being called to. A man named Harold Marsh had been rushed in from his home in Queens, which was not far from Doug's home, after suffering a massive heart attack. But it wasn't the heart attack they wanted to talk to her about. They were afraid the heart attack was only part of this man's problems. The colleague from the ER explained to Dr. Asnes that like the first patient, Doug Wise, Harold, the second patient here, was older but active and healthy. His family reported that he had suddenly developed muscle weakness, flu symptoms, and worst of all, a staggeringly high 105 degree fever. Dr. Asnes felt a knot growing in her chest. Fevers that high were practically unheard of in heart attack patients. Dr. Asnes thanked her colleague and then just ordered Harold to be moved immediately to the ICU. Her mind was racing as she began to connect the dots. Two men living only blocks apart had both come down with the same mysterious symptoms in less than a week. This could be the beginning of an outbreak. For the moment, Harold was stable, so Dr. Asnes hurried back to her office to have some time to think. But as soon as she arrived on the fourth floor where her office was, she saw a nurse sprinting into Doug Wise's room. So Dr. Asnes ran down the hallway and went into Doug's room as well, just in time to see a colleague shove a breathing tube down Doug's throat and hook him up to a ventilator. The colleague, who was an ICU doctor, then explained to Dr. Asnes that Doug's muscle weakness was now so severe that his lungs had basically stopped working. Dr. Asnes was thankful her colleague had acted so quickly, but she was afraid this was only the first case of something much bigger. And if others out in the streets were contracting this virus, the consequences could be catastrophic. Dr. Asnes turned on her heel and rushed toward her office. She needed to alert the New York Health Department right away. Five days later, on August 27th, a medical investigator at the New York Department of Health hung up the phone in her office wishing she'd never answered it in the first place. Her name was Annie Fine, and after a long week of work, she was ready to go home. She was knee-deep in planning her wedding, and she and her fiancé had wanted to knock out as many to-do items as possible over the weekend, but instead, it looked like she would spend her weekend at Flushing Hospital. A doctor there had called in a potential outbreak on Monday, and after several days of discussions and three more patients in the hospital with identical symptoms, her boss had finally decided it was worth investigating. Dr. Fine reminded herself that, in all fairness, she was the on-call epidemiologist that weekend. That meant she would be responsible for any emergency that came up. But in addition, her boss and good friend, Dr. Marcy Layton, had asked her personally to help out. And she was always game to help Dr. Layton. So on Saturday morning, Dr. Fine woke up a minute before her alarm clock began screeching. She managed to turn it off before it had the chance to wake her fiancé. And then she quietly got out of bed. Half an hour later, she headed down the stairs of her apartment building and saw Dr. Layton's car parked outside. She smiled as she jumped into the passenger seat, and Dr. Layton laughed and apologized for interrupting her weekend plans. Then Dr. Layton handed Dr. Fine a cup of to-go coffee, and they peeled off toward Flushing Hospital. After a short drive, Dr. Fine and Dr. Layton parked near the hospital and climbed out of the car. As soon as Dr. Layton had stepped onto the curb, 
She made a disgusted noise, and Dr. Fine turned to look at what she was disgusted at, and she saw there was a dead crow lying in the gutter right near Dr. Layton's feet. Both doctors had been seeing dead crows all over New York that entire summer. So they both just walked around the dead bird, and the two women headed for the hospital. Right outside the ICU, the two doctors were greeted by a tall, thin man wearing a lab coat. He told Dr. Fine that he was the chief resident, which meant he was a doctor in training, standing in for Dr. Asnes, who was out of town on a family emergency. He explained that in the five days since Dr. Asnes first called the Department of Health about her first two patients, three more people had been admitted to Flushing Hospital with symptoms of viral encephalitis. All five were older people who were previously healthy and active. Most worrisome, all five also had other symptoms not normally caused by viral encephalitis, including fever, stomach pain, confusion, muscle weakness, and severe difficulty breathing. The chief resident added that all five patients had declined really quickly. Four were now on ventilators, and the fifth was not, but they were delirious with pain. Dr. Fine felt unnerved. All of a sudden, wedding planning was the last thing on her mind. There were usually only about 10 viral encephalitis cases every year in all of New York City. But now, one small neighborhood in New York City had five cases in less than a week. And so far, nobody had figured out why. Dr. Fine asked the resident to go collect blood samples from each of these patients and submit them for additional testing. In the meantime, she and Dr. Layton would interview the patient's families and anyone else who was with these people in the week leading up to their hospitalization. The resident nodded and then led Dr. Fine and Dr. Layton to an empty conference room where they could call people and interview them. Dr. Layton would ask the questions and Dr. Fine would take notes. By that afternoon, Dr. Fine's writing hand was totally cramped. She spent hours taking notes as she and Dr. Layton spoke with the patient's family members. Outside, it was starting to get dark, so Dr. Fine rolled her chair toward the wall and switched on the overhead lights. The conference room table was littered with textbooks, stacks of medical journals, and reports on annual encephalitis cases in New York. Dr. Fine looked over at Dr. Layton and sighed. Despite hours of interviews and poring over the patient's files, they still did not know how these five patients in Flushing Hospital had contracted encephalitis. But they had found that all five patients had two things in common. First, that they all lived within a few square miles from one another in Queens, and second, they all loved to spend time outdoors in the evenings. A few of the patients, like Doug Wise, the first patient, would work in their gardens until nightfall. Others just liked to watch the sunset from their back decks or take long walks along the East River after dinner. Dr. Fine looked out the window as the street lamps flickered to life, and right as they did, it hit her. People were not the only ones who loved summer evenings. It's also the time when mosquitoes are at their most active. All five of their encephalitis patients were probably swatting away mosquitoes as they gardened or walked or gazed at the sunset in the gathering darkness each night. And Dr. Fine knew something else about mosquitoes. They spread disease. Diseases like encephalitis, a condition that often strikes older people like Doug and Harold more frequently. Dr. Layton was intrigued by Dr. Fine's idea, but she was cautious. If mosquitoes really were spreading some new virus to people, they should be able to find mosquitoes infected with the disease. And so until they were able to isolate the virus in mosquitoes, then Dr. Fine's idea was really just a theory. Before the doctors left the hospital that night, Dr. Fine wrote up an alert that Dr. Layton sent to all the neighboring hospitals, asking them to report any cases of viral encephalitis to the Department of Health. That way, she and Dr. Layton would know if the virus was spreading. Two days later, on the morning of September 1st, Dr. Fine sat at her desk, twisting her pencil in her hands. She was back in her office, feeling frustrated by the lab results she had just read. That morning, she and Dr. Layton had sent a small team to Northern Queens, where all these patients had lived, and the job of this team was to canvas that neighborhood and visit the houses of each encephalitis patient and try to find breeding mosquitoes. Well, that team collected several samples of mosquito larvae from standing water around the neighborhood, but none of those mosquitoes were infected with viral encephalitis. Meanwhile, Dr. Fine was still waiting for lab work to come back on the blood samples she'd collected from the five infected patients. While Dr. Fine thought about what she should do next, 
Dr. Layton knocked on her door. She said she had bad news. One of the encephalitis patients, Harold Marsh, had grown so weak that the doctors determined he would not recover. Moments ago, the family had decided to take him off life support. Dr. Fine's heart broke for Harold and his family. She was frustrated that she couldn't even tell them for certain what had killed their loved one. It felt like they were back at square one. But at the very least, Dr. Fine knew that the doctors at Flushing Hospital would be able to do an autopsy and take tissue samples they couldn't get while Harold was alive. Dr. Fine hoped that these samples could help them identify the virus and warn the public at large. The following morning, Dr. Fine walked into her office to find her boss, Dr. Layton, waiting for her with news about Harold Marsh's autopsy tissue samples. Tests indicated that Harold had died of something called St. Louis encephalitis, a very rare strain of the disease that's only spread by mosquitoes. Dr. Layton said that federal health officials had also checked the blood samples from the other four encephalitis patients in Queens, and they found that they too had tested positive for St. Louis encephalitis. All five of the patients had gotten sick from mosquito bites. Dr. Fine frowned. On the one hand, it was nice to know that her theory that mosquitoes could have caused this was in fact what caused this. But this diagnosis didn't really make sense. The patient's symptoms were all consistent with St. Louis encephalitis, but there had never been a reported case of St. Louis encephalitis in New York City until now. In fact, there were only about 30 reported cases a year in the entire United States, and these were almost exclusively in southern swamplands. Dr. Fine wondered if infected mosquitoes had somehow migrated north, but if they had, there would have been cases of it in other places along the eastern seaboard, and so far, the only cases of it were from this outbreak in Queens. Something just didn't add up. Dr. Fine told Dr. Layton that she was glad they finally knew what was going on, but deep down, she still could not shake the feeling that there was something off about this diagnosis. A few weeks later, Dr. Fine was in her office at the Department of Health when Dr. Layton knocked on the door. When she came in, she had a very serious expression on her face. Dr. Layton explained that she'd just gotten off the phone with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, and Dr. Fine's suspicions were correct. The virus they were investigating was not actually St. Louis encephalitis. It was much worse. A pathologist at the Bronx Zoo, of all places, had figured out the mistake. She'd been trying to understand why all these birds were dying all over the city, and she had discovered that they were actually contracting some form of encephalitis. And then after she learned about the St. Louis encephalitis outbreak in the city, she began to investigate whether that was what was killing all these birds. But tissue samples from the dead birds showed no sign of St. Louis encephalitis. Instead, the birds had a different strain that can easily be confused with the St. Louis strain, but it's actually much more dangerous and the birds were loaded with this different strain. In fact, the birds got this strain of encephalitis at such a high concentration that a mosquito sucking their blood could pass on the disease to the next creature it bites, including humans. And sure enough, when the CDC retested the blood of the patients at Flushing Hospital, they found that they too had the same strain of encephalitis as the birds. This strain is known as West Nile virus. West Nile is something that likely lots of people have heard of, but it's actually even more rare than the St. Louis strain, at least in the United States, because until this point, it had never been seen in the United States. It was only really seen in Africa. The CDC suspected that an infected mosquito from some other part of the world had found its way onto a plane maybe and then come to the US that way, or maybe a sick bird had gotten onto a boat and that's how the disease came to the United States. But now that this disease had crossed the ocean and arrived in the U.S., Dr. Fine knew it was here to stay. By the time the CDC put the puzzle together, as many as 1,900 residents of northern Queens were infected with West Nile virus. 62 people landed in the hospital, and 7 people died that summer in 1999 before the mosquitoes disappeared with the fall. And in the years since those initial cases, over 56,000 people have been infected in the United States. 2,776 have died as of 2022. Although the mortality rate of St. Louis encephalitis and West Nile is comparable, 
West Nile is far more dangerous. Because it can be carried by birds, West Nile has spread to all 50 states, while St. Louis encephalitis remains fairly localized and far less common. Doug Wise, the first patient to come in with West Nile, remained in Flushing Hospital for several weeks before he was healthy enough to transfer to a physical rehabilitation facility where he stayed for the next month. By spring of 2000, Doug was able to walk with the assistance of a special cane, but his left side never regained its former strength, and he continued to suffer episodes of short-term memory loss. But ultimately, Doug knew he was one of the lucky ones from that painful summer of 1999. He could at least still tend to his garden as long as he wore his mosquito repellent. In February of 2013, a young woman named Kim finally moved out of her parents' house and she moved into this tiny little apartment that she absolutely loved. Kim had severe social anxiety. She could not stand being out in public, talking to people she didn't know. And so she would do everything in her power to stay indoors. She had a job that didn't require her to travel. And so having this little apartment was like her little oasis. When she was there, she was safe. If she had to leave, she was practically running to her car and running back so she didn't have to talk to anybody. In those first few weeks she was living there, as much as she tried to avoid all contact with other people, there was one person she was kind of forced to have an interaction with, and that was her landlord. But her landlord turned out to be this awesome some old woman named Olivia who really took a liking to Kim and kind of looked at Kim as like her daughter. And Kim was surprised at herself for wanting to interact with Olivia. She was very comforting and she was this really nice lady. And so even though they didn't actually interact that much, they developed this relationship where Olivia liked to make food and she'd come over to Kim's door and she'd knock and she'd leave it outside of her door and she didn't expect Kim to come out and talk to her. She knew Kim was uncomfortable being out in public and so she didn't push her to do that. Instead, she just expected her to eat some nice food and whenever Kim was done eating, to put her dishes back outside the door and Olivia would take it up and she would go clean it and that was that. And so Kim really grew to love Olivia and was very happy to have her there. It was like she made her feel safe. Two months after moving into this tiny little new apartment, Kim started taking a new medication for her anxiety. Now, historically, she had taken a whole bunch of different medications and knew when you start a new one, it's not uncommon to have a whole bunch of side effects that you're just not used to and they're kind of awful and you need some time to get used to them. So at the same time she's taking this new medication, she starts to notice that she's forgetting things. Things in her apartment are being put in places she does not remember putting them. And things are going missing and she can't remember where she put them. And so even though she was expecting side effects from this new drug, she was really frustrated with the memory loss. She also noticed this medication made her exceptionally drowsy to the point where most days she had to take a nap for two or three hours in the middle of the day just to get through the day. Because Kim had such intense anxiety about being out in public, she did not want to go to the doctors to get a different prescription or to even talk to the doctor about, you know, is this normal? Because that doctor's visit would necessitate a whole bunch of interactions with people she doesn't want to interact with. And so she decided, you know what? I'm just going to take my medication. I'm going to let myself adjust to this new normal and everything will be just fine. During the time period that she's experiencing all these side effects that she is attributing to her new medication, she got a delivery from Olivia. It was a Greek salad that she knew Kim loved and Kim psyched about this Greek salad. She brings it in her apartment and she decides, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna have a nice day to myself. I'm gonna go in my bedroom. I'm gonna turn on Netflix and I'm gonna eat this salad in bed. It's gonna be awesome. And so she's sitting in bed, she's eating her salad, she's watching Portlandia and then she falls asleep right in the middle. Like as she's eating her salad, she's falling asleep. She's so tired. When she woke up, she's like, wow, I, I've never fallen asleep that hard and that fast before. And she's literally still got the fork in her hand from eating her salad. And then she notices on the other side of the bed, the left side of the bed, the sheets are all disturbed, like someone has been laying there. And Kim always sleeps on the right side of the bed. It was almost like a compulsion for Kim that she could never sleep on the left side, like it was bad luck. And she reaches her hand out and she feels that side of the bed where it's been disturbed and it's still warm. And so she quickly thinks to herself, well, I guess I must have rolled over and laid on that side of the bed and then rolled back to this side, just miraculously right back in the same position I was in with the salad fork still in hand. And that's when it kind of clicks in her head, like that's not possible. That's not possible. So what does that mean? Does that mean someone's in my apartment right now? 
And so she leaps out of bed, she gets her phone, she enters 911 and she's ready to dial it. And she flips on all the lights in her apartment. She's running around and there's no one in her apartment. The apartment's still locked, everything is normal. And so she puts her phone away and her heart's still racing. She's very stressed out about what's just occurred. Because in her mind, in the back of her mind anyways, she knows she didn't roll over. That didn't happen. This is when Kim began to wonder, are all these strange happenings in my apartment connected to what just happened now? Because this incident right here does not feel medication side effect driven. And so all of a sudden she's looking at the other weird things in her apartment, like the missing toothbrush and the missing shoes and things getting moved around as suddenly connected. And it dawns on her that maybe she's been blind to something else happening. Maybe someone is breaking into my apartment. So for the next couple of days, Kim watched her apartment like a hawk to see if there was any indication of somebody breaking into her apartment at any point. And there was nothing. She always locked the door. She always kept the windows shut. The only thing that stood out to her was when she woke up in the mornings, her bedroom had a very distinctive smell to it. It wasn't her smell and it wasn't a smell she was used to. It was like another person's smell and it really freaked her out. She decided it's time to tell my parents. And so when she tells her parents and she's describing out loud what's been going on in her apartment, it's the first time she's hearing herself say this stuff out loud. And it sounds way more creepy and way more scary than it did in her own head. And so as she's telling them, she's becoming scared to go back to her apartment. And her dad picks up on that and says, hey, I'll go back with you. We'll look around your apartment and we'll make sure it's it's safe and secure. And then on the way out, we'll check in with your landlady and we'll let her know what's going on. So she's brought in and everything's gonna be fine. They go back to her apartment, they go inside and when they walk in, everything looks normal. They kind of do a walk through the apartment, looks normal. But before her dad leaves, he says, hey, let me just do a closer inspection of your whole apartment. Let me look everywhere and make sure there's not like some special way to get in here just to give you peace of mind. And so he went into her bedroom and he starts looking around and he's lifting up the mattress and looking underneath. And then he opens up her closet, which is this big closet, lots of clothes in there. It's not quite a walk-in closet, but it's big enough that you can easily stand in there. And her father reaches in and splits the clothes and he uses his light to look at all of the back wall and he pushes on it and he taps on it and he sees if there's any sort of special compartment there's not but before he walks out again he notices a little blurb of writing on the bottom right corner of the inner wall an area that you could only see if you were standing in the closet looking for strange things on the wall of the inside of this closet he kneels down to take a look at it and it's this little tiny blurb of text that says come back here so I can look at you and the only way you could write it is if you were laying down in this tiny little corner facing the exit of the closet and that's when her father looks at the bottom of the closet and one of the slats on the closet door was missing. And so in theory, if you were someone that was writing this message, you'd be laying down where your eyes would be looking through that slat right at her bed. Her father put it together and he stood up. He walked out to his daughter and he said, come over here. He showed her what's in her closet and he said, did you write that? And she goes, no. And he goes, all right, it's time to leave. They walk outside, they go to his truck and he calls the police and he says, someone's breaking into my daughter's apartment. Police show up and using CCTV footage, they capture a grown man regularly going into Kim's apartment in the middle of the night and he clearly has a key. It would turn out to be Olivia's grown adult son named Henry who lived with her, who apparently as soon as he saw Kim for the first time, he fell madly in love with her and became very obsessed with her and he developed this fake relationship in his mind where he believed he and Kim were dating, even though Kim didn't even know Henry existed. She didn't even know he was living with Olivia. She had never seen him before. During questioning, Henry said what he did is he got sleeping pills and he ground them up and anytime his mother was delivering food to Kim, which she loved to do and she was always excited about it, so she was talking about it so he would know it was happening, he would put sleeping pills in her food, he would mix it in and then he knew as soon as it was delivered, she would be asleep and he would use his mother's spare key to go into the apartment and what he said he did is he never touched her. He never laid a hand on Kim. Instead, he laid next to her in bed or watched her from inside the closet. So for the four months that Kim lived in this apartment where she believed every time she came inside and shut the doors that she was kind of away from society, she could just be alone in her bubble. Well, in reality, there was some psychopath just a few feet away from her almost the entire time. When Olivia found out about all of this, she made a point to tell Kim she had nothing to do with it and she was terribly sorry, but. Spring of 2013, a young woman named Melissa finally moved out of her mother's house and got her own place across town. For the first few months she was living there, she never noticed anything strange. 
But about three months into living there, things started to get a little bit weird. It started with a whole bunch of hang-up calls where someone from different numbers would call, she'd answer, and she could hear them breathing, but they weren't saying anything. And then she started getting these huge bouquets of flowers delivered to her front step, but they were delivered from Anonymous. Then after that, she started noticing things in her kitchen and her living room were going missing. Things like plates, cups, drink coasters, salt shakers, forks and knives, little things, but since she lived alone and she was the only one moving these things, they really stood out. Melissa had this habit that every time she went to bed, she would unplug her TV. She had this irrational fear, if she didn't do that, that it would spark a fire and her house would burn down in the middle of the night. So she was pretty obsessive compulsive about always making sure the TV was unplugged before she went upstairs to bed. And so one night around the same time she's getting these hang up calls and there's flowers being sent to her door and things are going missing, she unplugs her TV and she goes up to bed. The next morning she gets up and comes downstairs and the TV's plugged in again. She convinces herself that, well, she must have forgot to unplug the TV. As rare of an event as that is, it has to be what happened. And so that night she unplugs the TV and remembers looking directly at the plug, confirming that yes, I've unplugged the TV. And then she puts it down and looks again at the outlet. It's not plugged in. It's definitely not plugged in. And then she goes upstairs to bed. The next morning when she walks downstairs, she had the sense of dread that when she turned the corner, because her TV was right at the bottom of the stairs, that when she turned the corner, it would be plugged in again and her worst nightmare would come true, that something is happening on my first floor when I'm asleep at night. And as she comes down the stairs and turns the corner, what does she see? The TV is plugged in again. She's horrified, but has no idea what to do. It's not some malicious act. And she's telling herself, well, maybe I forgot again, but then she's like, no, I remember last night staring at the plug. I definitely unplugged it. And so she flies around her first floor to make sure one, everything is locked, but two, no one else is in here. And when she's satisfied that, yup, it's empty down here, and two, everything is locked, she sits there thinking, well, now what do I do? Do I call the police and say, someone's plugging in my TV? You know, she can't do anything. And it was at this point that Melissa developed a very real fear of her first floor and she began going to bed so early at night because she could not be on that floor when it started to get dark. And so imagine living alone, being afraid of going down to your first floor, how scary it would be at night when you're laying in bed, your door's shut, and any noise you hear in the house, you're gonna attribute to your first floor. And so Melissa was living this absolutely wretched life where she's scared of everything outside of her bedroom. And so with that as context, Melissa goes to bed one night super early, probably like three o'clock. The sun's not even down yet, but she's upstairs. But eventually it does get dark outside and she still has not fallen asleep. And so she sits up in bed and she turns on the TV. And right away, the channels on the screen start to change. And she's thinking, oh, I must be laying on the remote. But then she remembers the remote's in my hand. And so she's looking at the remote and then she's looking at the TV. She's not touching her remote and the channels are still cycling. Now, Melissa had what's called a skybox, which means her downstairs TV was connected to her upstairs TV and vice versa. If one was changing the channel, in real time, the other changed the channel. And so as she's looking at her remote and not touching it and looking at the screen as the channels are changing, it dawns on her that someone downstairs is changing the channels. And so frozen in fear, all she can think to do is turn off her TV because that's the one function that does not have any impact on the other TV. So she turns the TV off. And so in total darkness, in a house she's already terrified of, she is straining her ears to try to hear some sign that this is either something, someone's down there flipping through channels, or this is nothing, and I just happened to turn the TV on when the skybox was malfunctioning. And as she's sitting there, all she can hear is her own breathing, and she can feel the pounding of her heart in her chest. But she doesn't hear any sounds in her house. She doesn't hear the TV on. She doesn't hear footsteps, doors opening, none of that. It's silence in the house. So after what probably felt like an eternity, she just grabbed a pillow and clutched it in front of her and put her head into the pillow and just laid like that until she eventually fell asleep. The next morning when she gets up, the sun is out and it's this huge relief because suddenly with the sunlight pouring in the windows, it was like the house wasn't scary anymore. And she's telling herself, you know what, that had to have been just some anomaly with the skybox. I bet I go downstairs and the TV's unplugged. And so she goes downstairs and the TV is unplugged. And so that for her kind of confirms that, okay, the paranoia is getting to me. I'm losing my mind a little bit. I gotta tell someone what's going on. And so as it happens, that day she was going to a family birthday party 
And so when she gets there, she pulls her older brother aside and says, here's the strange things that are happening in my house with the skybox and all this. And at first he looked at her like, really? This is what's going on? You're seeing ghosts in your house? But when she really focused on these specific things that were happening, like the plug going back into the wall two separate times, and then the skybox thing. So the TV is kind of wrapped up in the weirdness that's been happening in her house and the missing items in her house. And so for the brother, it all kind of added up to, okay, this does seem a little bit weird. And he offered to live with her for a few days and just see it for himself. And as they're talking, their younger brother happens to walk by, overhears the conversation and says, oh, I'll stay there too. For four days, the two brothers lived on the first floor of Melissa's house and they don't see anything. They don't hear anything. It's completely ordinary. And Melissa at first was reassured, but then started to think, does that mean whoever's been doing this stuff is watching my house really closely and knows that I have, you know, protection at my house right now and they're staying away. Does that mean I'm being watched really closely? And so finally, when her brothers are getting ready to leave after the fourth day, she was practically begging them to stay. She couldn't stand the idea of staying in this house. Her brothers reassured her that she had nothing to worry about, but if she experienced anything weird, Anytime, any day, just call or text and they would be there in a heartbeat. Although she did not feel reassured, it was starting to get late, at least by her standards, it was like three o'clock. So the sun's getting close to going down, so she needs to go upstairs. So she goes back in her house and does like 20 trips around her house to confirm everything is shut, everything is locked, no one's in the house, everything is safe, and then she goes upstairs to bed. But like most nights, she was so scared of everything outside of her bedroom door that she couldn't sleep. And as she's laying there in utter silence in her room, she hears the unmistakable sound of her back door opening. And she hears footsteps walking through her first floor. And then she hears the TV turn on and her brothers have been watching her TV last and they had the volume set really, really high. So as soon as the TV went on, it blared all through the house. And immediately the TV turned back off because whoever turned it on knew that that was gonna wake up whoever was in the house. Melissa doesn't know what to do. Before, whatever the heck was happening in her house was a little bit subtle. It was like she had to think about what she was hearing to confirm it was actually happening. Now, this person is just strolling into her house in the middle of the night and flipping on the TV and blaring it through the house. And so she immediately is like, oh my God, what do I do? And she picks up her phone and she calls her brother. Then he picks up right away and she goes, someone is in the house. The brother's like, I will be there in 10 minutes. Do not leave your bedroom. Don't do anything. Stay on the phone with me. So Melissa's shaking out of fear and she gets up as slowly as she can and she walks over to the window to get as far away from the door, which was locked as she possibly could. And she's glancing out the window, waiting to see her brother pull up as she listens for any sign that this person downstairs has begun walking upstairs. Finally, Melissa sees out of the corner of her eye, her brother's car pulls up across the street and he, along with her younger brother, hop out. They run across the street towards her house, they hop over the fence, and they run down the alley between her house and her neighbors, and they go towards the back out of sight. She's still on the phone with him, and she's saying, do you see him, do you see him, do you see him, do you see him? And he says, hold on, he goes to the back of the house where he knows you can look in and basically see the whole first floor. And as soon as he gets to that spot where she's expecting him to give her a report, and he pauses, there's silence on the phone, and she goes, what do you see? And he says, okay, yep, there is someone in your living room right now. I'm gonna hang up and call the police and I'm gonna call you right back. Now, Melissa knew what she heard was very real to her, but to have it confirmed by her brother right now took this to a whole nother level of fear. Now she's legitimately fearing for her life. There is a person, an intruder in my house right now, confirmed. They are right downstairs and they've been coming into my house probably for weeks. And so her brother hangs up the phone and begins calling the police. Meanwhile, Melissa is just standing in this room, horrified as she listens to a stranger walk around the first floor of her house. But because she was hearing the footsteps clearly downstairs, she decided she would just walk over to her door and look through the keyhole, which was oversized on her door. And if you looked through it and over to the left, you'd actually look downstairs to the first floor. You'd only see a sliver of the first floor. And so very carefully, she walks her way over to the door. And as she kneels down to look through the keyhole, her phone rings. It was in her pocket and it wasn't on silent. It was on loud and it was her brother calling back. And she kind of fumbles for her phone. She drops it on the ground, it's still ringing. And she finally silences it. And then reflexively, she pokes her head back and looks through the keyhole and standing at the bottom of the stairs, looking up at her is a man with a hat pulled over his eyes who's clearly heard the sound and he begins walking up the stairs. 
She's falling over backwards, screaming at the top of her lungs to get her brothers inside. She hears them come charging inside. She hears this epic struggle on the stairs and she hears this person who's in her house because it was a voice she didn't recognize screaming, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then it's quiet. And so she opens that door because she wants to help if she can. And she looks and she sees her brothers have this man pinned on the stairs. He's not moving. And she sees her younger brother is holding something. And he holds it up to her and he just shakes his head. And it's a freaking knife. And then she puts it together that the stranger in her house was carrying this knife. And before she can even take that information in, the older brother takes the hat off of this guy and it's their mother's ex-boyfriend from 10 years ago. The same one they all believed had an inappropriate attraction to Melissa. Police show up and take him away and he quickly admitted to sneaking into her house for months. They don't know how he got in and he would never tell them, but he admitted that, yep, I was breaking in almost every single night. But he never gave a good reason why. He just started doing it. Police cited mental illness as the likely culprit for why he was doing it. And the family believed this could be something more sinister, but either way, he was given three years in jail and the family, once again, cut all ties with him. On October 17, 1941, 73-year-old Philip Peters was supposed to join his friends for dinner, but he never showed up. His neighbors knew Phil was living alone at the time because his wife had recently fallen and broken her hip and was in the hospital. And so they were worried about Phil being on his own and they thought, you know what, let's just be sure, let's call the police and have them go over and check on him. When the police arrived at his house, they knocked on the door, no answer. They tried the door handle, it was locked. They tried the other door, that was locked too. They looked in the windows, it was all dark, and they had to get another neighbor who had a key to open the door for them. When they stepped inside, there was blood everywhere, on the walls, on the ceiling, everywhere. And in the middle of the kitchen is Phil Peters, face down, he has been bludgeoned to death. The police immediately draw their weapons and they're looking around the house thinking someone could still be here. And they clear the whole house and there's no one there. And so a whole bunch of detectives converge on the house and they start investigating. And they realize pretty quickly how strange the scene was. Nothing in the house was vandalized. Nothing in the house was stolen and Phil himself was just a very modest, retired auditor. He certainly didn't have any enemies, and so the revenge angle didn't necessarily make much sense. But then you gotta remember that when police first got there before they discovered his body, the house was shut and locked, and there was no sign of forced entry. And so whoever was in there with Phil at the time of his death must have known Phil enough to have a key of their own or have Phil open the door for them. So it made investigators wonder what would motivate some person that's in Phil's inner circle to commit such a heinous crime when the obvious angles such as theft, vandalism, revenge have basically been crossed off. Not to mention there was virtually no evidence of who could have done this with the exception of the murder weapon, which was this big piece of metal called a stove shaker. But the person who had used it to kill him had taken the time to meticulously wipe it off. So there was nothing on it, no fingerprints, no anything. So for months, detectives agonized over this case, but they got nowhere. Nine months later, a housekeeper was hired by Phil's widow to help around the house now that Phil was gone. And she said, as soon as she moved in, she started hearing strange tapping sounds all through the house, but didn't think anything of it. And so that day, the day she's calling police, she's alone in the Peters residence and she hears the tapping and it's coming from the kitchen. And she thinks, oh, it's gotta be a woodpecker just outside the house, outside the window. And she said, as she looked into the kitchen, on the other side of the kitchen was a door that opened up to a flight of stairs that went to the second floor. And she said it was slowly opening. And out from behind comes this white hand that reaches to the side of the door and begins to pull it open. And she screams and the hand retracts back into the space and then she hears it storm up the stairs and run around on the upstairs before going silent again. She ran out of the house and she ran to a neighbor's house to call the police. The police immediately go to the house and they go inside, guns drawn, and they're looking for this person because they're thinking perhaps the murderer is back and they're looking all through the house and there's nothing. There's not even a sign of a break-in. And so the police go back to the housekeeper and to Miss Peters. They explain that we couldn't find anyone, but given the history of your house, we don't think it's safe for you to be in there. 
And so the housekeeper didn't go back and Miss Peters was moved back to the hospital where she could be looked after during the police investigation. At this point, the police decide we're gonna permanently stake out this house. We're gonna have two detectives that are outside this house watching it at all times. And so two detectives go and they're sitting outside and for a couple of days, they're not seeing anything, they're not hearing anything. And they decide to just go inside and have a look around. They both walk into the house, they go upstairs, they look around, they don't see anything, they go back downstairs. And as they're standing on the first floor getting ready to leave, they hear what sounds like a doorknob turning upstairs. They both heard it, so they go upstairs and they start searching different rooms. And one of the detectives goes into the bedroom and opens up a closet and past all the clothes, bottom left-hand corner, he sees a a foot dart into a little space in the back corner of the closet. And without any hesitation, this guy jumps head first into the closet and grabs the foot of this mystery person who's crawling into a tiny little panel in the back of a closet. And he holds on to this person who's fighting with their life to get away. And he starts pulling them out and he's yelling for his partner to come over. He comes charging in. They both grab this person and they yank this person out. And they would describe him as the strangest looking person they had ever seen. He was super tall, but rare thin and his skin was so dirty it appeared gray. His name was Theodore Conies and he had been living in this house for a year. Before Conies moved in he had fallen on hard times, he was sleeping in alleyways and as it started to get colder in September of 1941 he decided he would approach his longtime friend Phil Peters and he would ask him for some money and maybe an opportunity to crash at his house for a couple of days but as it happened when he got to Phil's house Phil wasn't there. Phil was at the hospital visiting his wife who had a broken hip. And so the house was vacant. And Coney saw an opportunity and he broke in. And at first his plan was just to steal food, get warmed up a little bit and then leave. But he noticed when he was looking through the house for things to take, that in the back of one of these closets was a panel that led to this tiny little almost secret attic space that wasn't being used for anything because it was impossibly small. You'd have to be incredibly skinny just to get through the little square opening that would bring you into this little space. And then once you got in, you could only get in by slithering head first in. You couldn't stand up. You had to be laying the entire time. You couldn't extend your legs all the way if you're a full grown adult. So you're kind of tucked up in almost like a pseudo fetal position. But Coney saw this as a huge upgrade from living on the streets and he decided that this is where he's gonna live for the winter. And so he went around the house gathering supplies between blankets and food and water and he filled his tiny little space and then he went back downstairs and he locked the front door again, made sure everything looked the way it was when he showed up. And he went into his little space and shut the door behind him. And when Phil came home that night, he didn't notice anything. And for the next several weeks, Phil never noticed a thing. Every time Phil would leave, Conies would sneak out, go downstairs, make himself some coffee, get a bite to eat, and then go back up to his little space. He even cut into the house's wiring system and stole one of Phil's radios, brought it into the cubby with him, attached it to the new wiring, and he got to listen to the news so he didn't feel so isolated from the outside world. But about a month later, Conies leaves his little spot to go downstairs because he thinks Phil is gone. He gets to the kitchen, he's going to the fridge. When he shuts the fridge, he looks over and there's Phil standing there looking at him like, what are you doing in my kitchen? In a panic, Conies grabs the stove shaker and beats Phil to death. Not knowing what else to do, he wipes off the murder weapon, leaves it where it is. He goes in the fridge, he gets some more food and drink and he goes right back up to where he lives. He would follow the investigation of Phil Peter's death on his radio curled up inside of Phil Peter's house. Conies was quickly found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. After hearing his sentence read to him, he says out loud, now I feel safe. I'll have a better home than I've had in years.
that's going to do it, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. And if you found today's secret, please let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. The first one to do that will get pinned. If you enjoyed the video today and you haven't done this already, please offer the like button a beer, but then give them an Oduls. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.